Speaking of duck season, how did you guys' duck season shape out since we're the end of it? You know, honestly, it started horrible, but it uh, towards the end it started picking up a little bit, at least a little more consistent for us. But yeah, it was uh, pretty inconsistent all duck season until the last like maybe three weeks, I would say. You got some Georgia. Yeah. I got two bands this year. Two yeah. bands? Oh, two bands. Yeah. You band them and then release them? and then One of them, <laughs> no. See, one was in Oregon, not okay. our permit. Okay. And then actually the other one was an 11-year-old mallard that was banded at Conway the year after I left Conway. So it was the one summer I did not work for CWA in the past 14 years. <laughs> There's a chance of that. <laughs> yeah. CB banded it at Conway. Oh, uh, that's so, cool. Yeah. One of the numbers was worn off. I had to etch it, but oh, oh, that nice. was pretty neat. Oh. Okay. 11 years old. It's the last, old last bird I shot this season, yeah. And on a good note, are you going to go out on Wednesday? I'm going to definitely try and go out one more time. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Definitely have to go pick up decoys like uh, that's, Dan hinted That's too. the only reason I'm going on Wednesday is to pick that's up decoys. A, yeah. <laughs> In the miser- misery of the rain, just to yeah. add the icing on the season. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It was an odd season, like you said, just kind of real inconsistent. Um get rolling and then be completely different, you know, yeah. one day to the next. But couldn't you know. predict it. You know, usually we in a south wind storm at our club, it's at least four blinds are gonna shoot limits. Yeah. And like this year, I don't think a blind shot twenty one ducks in one day. Yeah. You know, it's just weird. You had a lot of that. Yeah. You had a lot of the big clubs too. You like you know Yeah. Struggling. Big name clubs. Yeah. Uh some of the worst harvests ever on record, you know. But I just think is not that there was ducks around, but um, it was such a warm season. You know, there's really not re- any reason for them to move. You know, during the daytime. You know. Yeah, we were kind of talking earlier, but you know, a lot of see, in my opinion, a lot of birds came down, found where those sanctuaries were. <laughs> yeah. Um, stayed real tight. They didn't need to go out during the day much during hunt times. No reason. And no. Uh, go out at night, load up on their food, and go back and sit all day. Yeah. So basically, all season until. Uh, we had that one cold snap in what late December that pushed some birds yeah. down. That was really it. That yeah. one day at college camp was like the co- the coldest day of the yeah. season. Yep. Um, other than that, it was like it was hard to try to figure out what to wear to the duck blind so you yeah. weren't sweating. You know, I've yeah. never hunted under more gray skies than I did this year. It was just great <laughs> sky, no wind. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Save it for the Blind Podcast. Jeff, if you want to do our introduction today for our guests, we can get this thing rolling. Yeah, so uh, in front of me, we have Brian Huber. Uh, everyone knows Brian, CWA biologist, super knowledgeable, runs our wood duck program, does all of our banding. And uh, Dan Yaparangari is a retired biologist with the California Department of Fish and Game then, Wildlife Now. Um, but has been very instrumental with um, all things waterfowl in our state, and he is a humble grad and just a fun guy to be around. And uh, thanks for coming on, man. My pleasure. It. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. A humble grad surrounded by three Chico grads. That's yeah. the first time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got him. So finally, got him outnumbered. I know. <laughs> well, the next question is, where's the beer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got the whiskey. We offered it. No one wanted to take it. I mean, it's almost noon, but in the podcast room, that doesn't matter. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we're basically kind of here today to talk about, um, you know, tule geese closures and, you know, what's going on with pintail and the pintail limits and kind of where a lot of that stuff started and, and kind of where we're at now. So, yeah, Dan, go over your background for me for, you know, how you got into it and into the positions you were in. Yeah, well, first off, like I'm old, right? <laughs> so I, I started as a kid duck hunting and... Um, it always bring whenever I say this, so apologize for this because it's a deeply personal story. But when my dad passed, uh, one of the things I found in his garage was an old backpack that I used to follow around the Susun Marsh. I remember just seeing that in the dark. And I said, I can't throw this out. And I tossed, my brother and I were going through stuff. And, and I tossed it in the trailer to, to throw it out. And I said, I can't throw this out. So I took it out. And a little while later, I bumped into it, and I looked through the pockets, and there's the old spark plugs with monofilament on that he used to have for spare decoy weights, you know. <laughs> and I said, this is a piece of, the pack weighed 40 pounds empty, right? So I said, I got to throw this away. So I threw it away, and then I took it out again, and then I threw it away and buried it. <laughs> so I just couldn't <laughs> handle it. So I started duck hunting when I was, in fact, the other day, I was cleaning stuff out, and I found my first, I think, hunting license from 1967. Okay. And and I've got almost all of them. The only one I can't find is uh, the year I got married in 1977. So I don't know whether the wife 
forbid me from going to hunting <laughs> or whether I hid it from her for that one year. I, I don't know what the story is, but um, so I wanted to be a, a, a journalist when I started. So I was at journalism school and I realized that this wasn't working for me. So I took a year off, worked in construction for a while and asked myself, what do I want to be when I grow up? And, and I said, well, I want a duck hunt. And I realized that I can't call very well and I'm a marginal shooter. So that wasn't <laughs> going to really work. So I went to school at Humboldt. And I got my uh, bachelor's in 1977, 78, and uh, went back to school, worked uh, on the Aleutian Canada Goose. I worked two summers in Alaska, did my master's work on that, graduated in uh, 82 or whatever, and went to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service at Humboldt Bay Refuge. Left them for the state in 1984, went down to Southern California where I was a district biologist, where I was down there for four years, and I... Uh, Got sued for $28 million on the first mountain lion in human interaction. We <laughs> survived a helicopter crash and I punctured my left eardrum, uh, falling in a bush doing a lease bills vireo survey in a desert wash. So I like, I had to get out of that. <laughs> <country>. <laughs> so I came back up, uh, started in the waterfowl project in 88 and uh, did that till uh, about 2011. Somewhere in there, the boss fell on his head and I found myself in the corner office as deputy director at the moment in time, I had, uh, I think I had one or two ties and six pairs of Levi's. And I had to turn that around, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I retired with about 20 ties and one pair of Levi's. So anyway, it was a great career, 32 years. Um, lots of great friends that I went to school with that I still worked with and still hang with and still hunt with. And um, it, it's just the passion in the waterfowl community from my last job experience cannot be matched. It is just just unique and phenomenal and wonderful. And it was just great to be a part of it, you know, for that yeah. whole time. So, so I'm glad to take a busy day out of my busy schedule <laughs> and, and come down and chat with you all. Good. You could be picking up decoys, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. There are still three more days. I could go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and not. Well, Dan, I mean, kind of what we get a lot of questions on hunters is, you know, obviously – they're out hunting and see a lot of pintail. We could only harvest one. It's been minimal take for, you know, over 20 years. You know, why is that? And kind of if you could talk about how regulations are set and, and why we're seeing that one pintail take and hopefully to, to increase it here in the future. But that's the thing that we get from the guy that's been hunting 30, 40 years or the brand new novice person that's hunted one time and come out like, well, I do see a lot of pintail seems to be the most common bird here, but we can only harvest one. And why is that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great question and, and obvious, right? Yeah. So it helps for me anyway to go back a little bit and think about how duck regs were set prior to adaptive harvest management, which was a breeding pair survey, a brood survey, a status meeting in Denver every year on July 4th or something. It was like set in stone. And then the flyway councils would meet. The SRC would meet the service regulations committee and consultants from each flyway. And it was like sausage being made in a smoke-filled room, and out would come your duck rigs. And then when ducks took a dump in the 80s, we lost, uh, you know, uh, prairies went dry, duck populations all dropped. And at the same time, a lot of really smart people were starting to work on a better way to do this. And out of that stew came adaptive harvest management. So I'll use AHM from time to time. And we watched that in the Pacific Flyway, and if you remember... The, the packages, AHM, that has an objective, which is to meet the mid-continent mallard goal established in the waterfowl plan, and competing models as to which one drove duck stocks, is it harvest, is it productivity? And it was an objective way, once you develop the, the set of tools, the models, it was an objective way to set regs rather than have a bunch of guys go in the back room and come out and trade your pintail limit for our canvas back limit for your, mm -hmm. you know, not that that went on per se. But we watched that in the mid, early 90s or so. And then when the first packages came out, it had a stable bag for pintail, no matter what the pintail population was doing. And so if you looked at the pintail, they were slow behind every other duck stock, but they were starting to come back up. And we said to ourselves, well, let's join the party. Let's, let's have a structured approach to setting pintail rigs. So we set up a prescribed process, which the flyways all adopted in 1997, and that's what led to that three-bird bag limit in 1997. And I would like to say that the service looked at that and said, we can't have that. So they came up with what's the drive strategy, which took another three or four years to develop in 2010, which is the one we're still operating now yeah. under, right? 
And, and that thing has an objective, and this is something a lot of folks misunderstand. They think the objective of the strategy is to get to the North American plan goal for Pintail. It's not the objective. Which is what number? I can't remember. Yeah, so this is what in, being in, an in old the, guy. In the millions. Uh, right? Oh, yeah, probably four, three and yeah, a half yeah, or something four, like three that. Or yeah. half, four okay, million. thanks. <clears throat> um, the objective of this strategy is to maximize long-term uh, cumulative harvest. So over the infinite time horizon, what decisions can we make on an annual basis that will achieve that predicted harvest? Constrained by, you know, under the uh, prescriptive strategy, we ended up with one year, if guys remember, a season within a season, what we call a partial season. So we had a 60-day pintail season embedded in a 100 or whatever the package yeah. was then. And a lot of people didn't like that. Bad regulation for public relations, um, especially in other states where pintail don't matter um, so much anyway. And so the long, current strategy limits us to three choices, a closed season, a one bird bag, or a two bird bag. And uh, that's, that's the goal of the strategy is to maximize harvest over the long term, not to reach the number. But if you want to achieve harvest, you kind of, the way this model set is working is like, you need a one bird bag, you need a one bird bag, you need a one bird bag. And so that's where we've been. And what folks forget, I think, is that, you know, we've had really high pintail estimates, breeding population six, seven million back in the 50s. Uh, in the 90s or in the 70s, I think it was three, four, five, six million at that point. We had winter indices well over a million. We were harvesting 50, 60, 70, 80,000 pintail in this state. Mm -hmm. um, you, you don't, we don't have those pintail numbers anymore. Right? People mm -hmm. have to accept that. Yeah. that. The prairies have changed. Lots. Of, we just don't have those kind of pintail numbers. But in the meantime, since 2010, lots of other work has been gone going, and there's a lot of smart people working on this stuff. So it's pretty well accepted now that survival rates aren't affected by regs. So you can have more restrictive regs or less restrictive regs, and you don't change that basic population parameter anymore. So that's a good reason to look at things and say, well, what are we doing? Because there's a desire in some places for a more liberal pintail limit, which takes me back to understanding that it's vastly important in this flyway, it is less so in all the other flyways. In fact, when we adopted the 2010 strategy, the service had provided about 80 options that you could do this package of bag limits and season links and closure levels, or this option, and there's 80 of them. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get a three bird option through the Pacific flyway. Because every time you had an option with a higher bag limit, you increase the predicted frequency of a closed season. And so if you're in Wyoming, who has the same number of votes on the California Flyway Council as California does, you don't, you don't care. You don't want a closed season on anything at any time. So hmm. you'll give up bag limit for that. And that's the context that I think hunters don't appreciate in California. This is shared resource. We don't own it. Yeah, It's shared with all the other states and another country and, and all that stuff. So uh, going forward... Some of these things that we've learned about habitats driving this population more than harvest rates are. There are some differences among different parts of the country in terms of what winter habitat is doing to stuff. Um, there's a couple other things going on. So you're, you're looking at a change, I think. I kind of think what you want to lead to. But we're in that strategy because we wanted a, a clear-cut way to set regs that we all agreed on the rules, then we'd turn the machine every year and run the rules. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think most people, I don't know if it's just for the general hunter, I don't know if they just don't read a lot of this stuff, but it's just it's just more angst and anger than looking at the facts and the numbers of the populations and kind of what the models are, are geared towards, you know? Well, it's not it's not intuitive sometimes, yeah. right? We, we think we understand how populations ebb and flow, which, you know, really there's what people have to appreciate is there's two ways populations grow, right? Either survival rates go up or recruitment rates go up, and there's two ways populations decline. Either they die at a higher rate or they're not born at a high enough rate. And so the balance between those pluses and minuses is what we try to achieve with harvest strategies, right? And um, you see what you see, but is it objective? Uh, I've been to places where I couldn't buy a pintail in the right. last few weeks. So, yeah. you know, if you ask me, there's no pintail, right? <laughs> but I know better than that, yeah. right? So, you know, trust the breeding pair survey. The other thing is that the whole world's gotten more complicated. Brian was just showing me satellite data on his phone a few minutes ago. <laughs> Heck, I <laughs> thought phones had a rotary dial. For that, <laughs> you know? and, and so, you know, to not expect that technology and those advancements in mathematics and modeling to be applied to duck harvest is not asking for the right thing, you know? 
if you go to the doctor and he says, you know, you've got this ails you, here's this drug that you can't pronounce, you take it, right? Because you trust your doctor. Yeah. And, and I say, you know, trust the science, even if you don't always understand it, because I don't. Yeah, well, because I, I asked this to another biologist, you know, because in California, you could our mallard population has gone down. You could choose seven mallards, and they're like, well, if you take the mallard model and you p- put pintail in there or whatever it was, uh, it'd be illegal to shoot a mallard, essentially. <laughs> and then and that, and from a hunter standpoint, you're like, okay, we have a couple hundred thousand, let's say, but you can shoot seven. But then as a hunter standpoint, people that could potentially shoot seven a day, it's very regional. You know, in terms of the the state of California, it's some big wetland areas, some public hunt areas, a lot of the other places, big rice country, et cetera, no wetlands around. They don't, they don't even see mallards, you know, that's not even part of their bag. So trying to explain that to some of the, just the general hunters to kind of open up their eyes of what the whole entire state looks like, you know, can be challenging because some people might only hunt. Grizzly Island, their entire hunting career, and that's all they see out there, you know, and they don't really know what the rest of California is seeing. Right. You know? well, I think that's kind of part of the the problem with the general hunter is, you know, we're out there hunting the rice fields and we see, you know, occasionally you'll see thousands of pintail, right? Yeah. And most people don't realize that we winter, what, about 50% of the continent population, right, give or take a little bit yeah. in that yeah. area. So, I mean, we're seeing such a huge percentage of that continental population of pintails, and it's deceiving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um. Another sticky one in terms of closures, and we do have the spec closure, um, you know, East I-5, Sacramento Refuge, and and the Thule Goose. Where did that kind of come from? When did we know that there was a subspecies, a Thule Goose, and that it was, you know, not doing so well in population size? Yeah, well, first off, I want to talk about jargon. Yeah. Because... If you look at the regulations, it's a management area. Yeah. If if the idea was to eliminate every bit of harvest of any particular stock, you would truly have a closure, and you would close the lookalikes as well, right? And so that closure came about to protect endangered Aleutian Canada geese in 1975, and it was actually mm-hmm. part of three different areas. The North Coast was closed, Sac Valley was closed, and there was an area in the San Joaquin Valley that was closed. And the area was much bigger to start with in 75. It went east of the river. And uh, it, it was close to the take of all white cheek geese, all three areas. The north coast all season, Sac Valley from the opener till mid-December. The San Joaquin Valley was closed from mid-November to the end of the season because the birds did that at the time. And at the time, there was about 1,000 of them. And at that time, there was they were federally endangered. So if you like bureaucracy, try to deal with having a game harvest take on a federally endangered species in which the Federal Endangered Species Office has some say in how many take. They have to do a consultation internally as to whether or not their regulations are going to cause harm to a species that they list as endangered. So this is not a place you wanted to be, right? But fortunately, we had a lot of good people on both sides and it all worked out. So Thule geese were first identified, oh, about 1800, 1900, somewhere in there. There's a large dark goose in the Susun Marsh that folks thought was different. Uh, the type specimen was named off of a bird in Texas, of all darn things, but we've kind of come to accept that that was not really correct. So uh, folks started in the 70s uh, paying attention to Thule geese, primarily SAC complex folks. And that continued into the 80s, and... Then we added white fronts to that closure area because the YK Delta white fronts were gone from 300,000 down to about 93,000 <clears> over harvest primarily on the breeding grounds, but we did our share. And at the same time, cacklers went from, I think, about 250,000 down to 23,000. So there was a period of very contentious uh, decades in there with the natives in Alaska blaming us, us blaming them, fingers were pointing everywhere. and. And I'll be real frank to be proud of uh, my previous bosses at California Fish and Game went up to Bethel and said, we'll stop shooting them if you'll stop shooting them, and came back to our commission in the middle of the season and acted a closure. And that's what it took, right? And it took us 20 years to get out of that hole that we got ourselves into in about 10 or 15. So white fronts were added to the closure in about 1985, I want to say. And at that time, in that management area, it was closed until November 30th, or, yeah, right, closed, and the bag limit was one. 
in, in that management area. And then as Aleutian Geese went forward and got delisted, Cacklers moved out of the thing. Uh, once we started shooting Aleutians, we killed the other two management areas on the North Coast and the San Joaquin Valley. Those were open year round. And we got more attention on Thule Goose stuff. Folks were getting daily counts. It was white fronts were starting to come back. And then our daily counts of white fronts didn't work very well because when we only had 93,000 Pacifics, you could count the Thule's in that mix, right? They Pacifics would hang up at Klamath. The Thule's would generally come straight down here. At least that's what we thought at the time. And so we could get a, a count, a coordinated count, Summer Lake, parts in eastern Oregon, refuges in California, Susun Marsh. And so... We ended up with that at that point, and, and now, okay, look, now we've got this bird that we think number six, eight, seven, nine, ten thousand, and white fronts are starting to come back like crazy, all right? 60,000, 80,000, 200,000. Can you speak to the fact of, of why that huge increase is starting, was occurring or, and is now? In the Pacifics? Yeah. Actually, no, I can't. I, I don't know enough about that, but you you got to look at most goose stocks are going through the roof. Yeah. So whether that's a climate-induced thing or, or what's going on specifically, um, we think the, the native harvest was particularly tough on brant, things that nest in colonies, mm -hmm. and white fronts are more dispersed uh, nesting. But, you know, the finger pointing, right? The uh, when native subsistence harvest is a, a traditional right, and we sure as heck ought to support that, right? Yeah. Because otherwise we don't need to be hunting birds either, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, But, you know, they went from walking to motorboats, and, you know, <laughs> so suddenly they're repeating shotguns, and so suddenly their ability to take. But I don't know that there are good data that describe a trend in white front harvest on the YK that would have affected the two leaguers thing. So I, or the, sorry, the Pacifics, so I, I would be more inclined to say it's just climate change. Gotcha. Yeah. When you're referring to YK, what does that mean? Yeah, thank you. I, I'll do that a lot. No please, please correct me every <laughs> minute. Yeah, Yukon Kuskokwim. So we think that... Um, but, you know, Thule goose breeding range wasn't even known until the late 70s. It was just a, a, a bird that was morphologically different, and it was thought to occur primarily in the marsh habitats. Didn't leave, you know, marshes, stayed in the rice country kind of thing, or didn't go out in the rice country. In the Pacifics, uh, a lighter color, smaller bird, and mm -hmm. came out of the YK. So north of the Alaska range, breeding range for Yukon, Kuskokwim, uh, White Fronts, south of the Alaska range, turned out to be Upper Cook Lynn, Redoubt Bay, was where Thule Goose were first found. And then the Redoubt Volcano happened in whatever year that was, I don't remember. And suddenly we couldn't even find breeding Thule Geese anymore. So our winter counts became even more critical. And as we learned more and more and more, you know, one of the things we can't do with uh, Thule's is do a breeding ground count. They seem to prefer, say, our spruce bog wetlands. Hmm. You can't count geese. It's like counting wood ducks. Look at our wood duck. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, there's wood ducks here. 9,000. Got it. Breeding yeah, service, yeah right? exactly. <laughs> and how many did you ban this year? We hatched 30,000. Yeah, our exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so 30,000 means you had at least 15,000 yeah. pairs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, so... The only way to get around this is, is these indirect estimates. We can't do fall counts anymore because their birds are swamped with uh, Pacifics. Uh, you can't breed them in the breeding ground anymore. So we started a project that uh, USGS folks had actually, Dennis Orthmeyer and, uh, uh, geez, I'm losing my mind. Uh, who's in the Susun Marsh now? Kazaza? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, John, it'll get to me. Flaskis? No, it'll come to me oh. at some point. Sorry, and I apologize if he sees this. I should be better. <laughs> Um, they actually started a project to do this and there were some analytical issues that, that we saw. And so we kind of took it up and they, they were wonderful. They, you know, their only way of telling two leagues apart was bill measurements. And we went to the author of that paper, Dennis Orthmeyer, and literally watched him put his hands on a goose to see how he did it. And then we did it to make sure that we were doing it the same way. And then Brad Bales up at Oregon Fish and Wildlife said, yeah, we were having trouble. I was in the gym on 9-11 watching smoke come out of big buildings because I could do that and still go up to some, uh, Sac Refuge and try and uh, rocket net geese because they were coming to loafing sites midday. And, and we just couldn't catch a tule goose down here in September to save our lives. And we started going up to Summer Lake where there are few, if any, Pacifics at that time of the year. So starting in 2003, we started this long project that's still going on. And it is one of my personal professional highlights 
to have been involved in that. The partnership with the service folks, Oregon Fish and Wildlife, Alaska Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife Service down here, analytical people. And uh, we ended up with a metric that passed enough muster to be peer reviewed. And, and now we've got a somewhat, somewhat reliable <laughs> population estimate. Um, you know, uh, annual estimates are highly variable and low precision. So you don't want to look at any one and say, oh, geez, we've got twice as many. And oh, geez, we've lost half of them. You know, those mm -hmm. are bad things to do. But over a period of time, five, 10 years, you can start to see statistically different trends from the trend. And that's the, the way the measurement should be considered, right? <clears throat> and so to get to where I think you're going, the current management plan, as far as I know, because I haven't looked for a while, has, has a population objective of about 10,000 adults, is what that plan says. <clears throat> we estimate about 12,000 birds in the population over mm -hmm. our period of time, right? I don't know what the current numbers are. And, uh, but we've got a high precision. So in my view, that plan needs to be rectified with the population metric that we're currently using. And uh, then during the development of a cooperatively developed plan, folks can think about what we want to do about harvest because we know that birds are shot in the Klamath Basin. We know they're shot outside the management area. We yeah. know they go down to the Susu and they get shot. But the goal of the management area, and the, say there's one in Alaska and one in Oregon, is to provide the opportunity on Pacifics without feeling like you're causing a change in trend on Thule's. And, and that's all it is. It's a management area. Mm -hmm. And, and it, we know it drives people crazy. But soapbox time, sorry. But... Duck hunters like to pride themselves on being the first conservationists. Yeah. Well, let's conserve this species. Let's right. not be the ones that can look back and go, oops. You know, we, we just don't want to do that. And I was forever tarred by that experience in the 70s when we and Alaska natives took cacklers from a half a million to 23,000 or whatever the numbers were. I know the white front number better from 30,000 to 93, 300,000 down to 93. And look at how long it took to to come out of it. Yeah. And as a result, we were probably been more risk averse than we probably should have been because now look at how many whoops over, overachieved on illusions, overachieved on Pacifics, you know, but then look at the bag limits, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But now we can't catch up with them, right? Right. So they're still stable, if not growing in both cases. And, and but that's a artifact of what we lived through in the seventies. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to go back real quick on how you guys got the um, population estimate because you mentioned you're banning them, right? And I know because I worked with you when we yeah. put the transmitters on, yeah. um, the VHF transmitters, yeah, yeah. and we track them around. <clears throat> and then we would also do the surveys around Delavan and SAC where we would find a caller and then how yep. many associated with that. And is that that's how you guys are getting those yeah, harvests? It, the uh, details have changed a little bit, but right. it's, it's a Mark Reside estimate. So yeah. if, if uh, maybe you Chico grads know about Lincoln Peterson indices is that? <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. I, after the hunt camp where it's Humboldt versus Davis, <laughs> and it's, it's finally good to get picked on by somebody else. I, under, I understand enough to not know enough about it. Yeah, if that well, makes sense. yeah, you know, really simply, it's really a conceptually, it's fine if if you, you've kind of got three numbers that you might know about, and you're trying to estimate the other one. You want to know how many there are of something, so you throw some markers out in the population, then you come along and recapture a bunch of birds, and the birds that you recapture, either by shooting or observing, some are marked and some aren't marked. So the ratio of marked to unmarked is then expanded based on how many birds you see to come up with the big N, which you think of as the population size. So yeah. the radio stuff is more about explaining the distribution it's the callers that give right. us the ability to identify uh, those callers. That, when yeah, you're in those right. Surveys. And so the yeah. real trick to this whole game was being able to consistently, if what I called the Thule and what you called the Thule during the survey were the same, we're probably okay. Yeah. But if you're real liberal or I'm real conservative, and it is one of the things that we did not do, and we should have, is. Um, there is some methodology from the medical literature in which you could go look at birds and I could go look at birds independent. Like somebody will put the scope on a group of birds and Brian will say, okay, I see three Thule's and six Pacifics, but you'll write that down, you won't tell me. And I'll do the same thing. You just do a whole bunch of replicates of that. And then you'll start to realize that, yeah, we have about 85% concurrence, but you could put a number on it. Right. We did it in an ad hoc way through training. I mean, you think about it, 
the number of people that contributed that data is large over time, but on any individual time, it was not that very many people. Mike Walder, Mike Carpenter, our, our staff. So it was six to 10 people a year, and we kind of on the job trained it. So right. I don't feel terrible about it, but I'd much be comfortable way to put a number on it. Yeah. You know? Yep. No, I think me and you did a survey together, and we, we concurred most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that's. But po- you were the big boss, so I had. Well, to you yeah, of course you're right. <laughs> right. Like that yes, has sir. not yep. held up for me <laughs> uh, in my whole career. That yep. has not held up. Yeah. Yeah. What do we know for harvest numbers of tule geese? Uh, Where, almost not, that almo- almost nothing. Right. What we as we, a percentage of the general population, uh, or. Uh, we know what comes off the check stations, right? Gotcha. And that's only a place where we can grab birds. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only way, you know, we did morphometric stuff. I understand they're doing DNA stuff now, right? Yeah. Which is much more accurate, much more prescriptive. Um, well, you don't have that human error because the measurement stuff, you could be off a half a millimeter and get a different answer. And there was overlap too. Yes. On that there, yeah, it was that a 90, was, 90% yeah, was kind of right. good. Yeah. But, but again, that's take a step back, right? I, I pimp science a lot because I think science is the answer to a lot, of, a lot of our problems. But on the other hand, it is not perfect. And anybody that thinks it is isn't paying attention, right? Remember the arguments over um, whether saccharin was good for you or sugar was good for you or eggs or milk. There's been a thousand things over time where science has rotated itself. So we kind of have an idea of the population size through what uh, Brian was talking about. And we kind of have an idea where harvest might be trending from sort of the core area. But we don't have an overall estimate because we need to get our hands on birds. And one of the things, it's almost like, it's almost like we don't want to know because you know what it costs? Oregon and Washington went through this with dusky Canada geese. You had to take a test, you had to get a permit, and you had to oh, take geez. your bird to a check station. Mm-hmm. It was a million dollar a year deal. <clears throat> and it's like, okay, what do we need to know? What is the population size approximately? What is it trending approximately? And, and if it's at a, some level and stable and going up, we're good. If it's stable or go, dropping, well, you got to start asking questions like that. And then you ask the question, why is it going down and what can you control? And unfortunately, harvest is one thing. If, if bear predation on geese in Alaska was one of the problems with dusky geese is high, there's not a whole lot you can do about that, mm-hmm. really. So we don't know. Yeah. We, we don't know, and uh, it'd be really hard to find out. But, but we, we also know um, from doing the telemetry stuff and now with the recent satellite stuff that that core area in the closure is still their mm-hmm. core area. I mm-hmm. mean, yes, birds move out to the Sassoon Marsh. Some of them go up to Klamath. But that core area, they really do still stick yeah. in that yeah. core area. The, the, the concept is in that management area, most of the birds are there most of the yeah. time. Yep. And, and that's like all you can hope for. Because yeah. if mm-hmm. they weren't, Holy smokes! Right. Absolutely. You got five to six hundred thousand Pacifics. Would love to provide that hunting <laughs> yeah. opportunity, and they taste really good. Yeah. So, um, what what is it about that area? Do you think is it the, the Tule Marsh and tradition? tradition yeah. I think because I know they like Tule marshes, and they they're really clannish birds. So they mm-hmm. right, they kind of stick together. They big really groups do. And big clans. Yeah, so. there's behavioral differences that yeah. you know, aren't really quantified, but anybody that's right. time in the field sees it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they even sound different to me. Yeah, yeah. yep. Yeah, when they're when they're fighting on the water, you, mm-hmm. know, you can hear. The so game. you guys have the experience of seeing them and knowing, you know, those are tule geese. I have more armchair Facebook biologists, and Brian sees this all the time. They post a picture, and oh, I shot this. This looks like a tule goose. Is there any way for average Joe to know besides actually taking scientific measurements to know it's a tule goose? Um, not really. No. I mean, okay, good. I, I, I said it makes me feel better. Yeah. 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 So I got together with him. We talked just like this. And I gave him some calipers and some data sheets and, and sat down with him. And the, you, we got to know the gender. We got to know the sex. So here's how you got to find that out, right? And and then here's how to carefully take the measurements. And and we've had uh, technical staff at some places that gave us data we threw out. Yeah, Because it, it did not, did not even come close to making sense to us. But so, no, it... it we used, Mike Wolder used to have a, a, a saying of a true Thule, you know, a bird that just jumped out at you, big adult male with a beak from here to next Friday and dark 
And yeah, I always <laughs> noticed their uh, the neck, the size of their neck, just mm-hmm. seemed so thick and dark to me. Yeah. And that's yeah. what really I could key yeah. in. And, I mean, and generally, fewer breast feathered black yeah. breast. Fe- and, and that's another fun thing. I, well, our sample size is two. Um, a lot of folks hypothesize that the more black feathers on a white front, the older it is. <laughs> I've heard that a million times. Yeah. The old tar yeah. belly is yeah. old goose. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, but our sample is two in which w- what we used to do because of the sensitivity about subspecies identification, we not only measured weight, but we photographed every bird we caught and banded. And then when we recaught a couple that we'd banded before that had fewer breast feathers, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> but and it's two, right? Yeah. It was only two birds, <laughs> you know? Oh, anyway. Talking about the subspecies, I mean, they are genetically a subspecies the, of a wide front of well, goose, right? So, right, the, uh, by taxonomy. And I think uh, it's another thing for folks to appreciate is that management agencies don't do taxonomy, right? Right. We don't get to say that's a subspecies, that's not a subspecies, we're not going to... Other scientists do that. The American Ornithologist Union takes care of that. It's generally accepted that, okay, we're going to re- look at the, how they revise Canada goose taxonomy, right? Yep. Um, like, Aleutians are always going to be Aleutians to me, not cacklers. Not, no, I can't call them <laughs> cac- Aleutian cackly now. Can't be done. Um, so it is a subspecies. Work has been done with samples from the breeding ground, which we believe is... All we know right now, Upper Cook Inlet, south of the Alaska Range, is where all of our radio tulies went during the breeding season. What throws some stuff off is that they will go molt migrate, which a lot of our candidates do as well, that we've banded over the decades here in California, which means that after the breeding season, failed breeders or non-breeders will jump up over the Alaska Range and go molt with Pacifics or even mid-continent birds. So you can get some mixing kind of stuff that goes on. If I remember right, I heard that one of our radio marked tulies that was marked at Summer Lake spent the summer down, winter down here, back up to the Upper Cook Inlet, maybe back down here in the third year, went to Texas. I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yep. so I have a college professor, Dr. Stanley Harris. Birds have wings and they use them. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, uh, you know, somebody sent me a picture and said this was an adult male. If they were confident about that and that Coleman measurement, from the where the feathers end on the upper beak to the tip in a straight line is over, God help me, I'm going to say remember, an yeah. inch and five something, eighths or yeah. something <laughs> like that. That's probably a tule. I mean, yeah. when, they, they can be so obviously different, and then you get females where it's just like, God, I can't even be sure. And so when we did the population estimate stuff, it was really important that folks be consistent. Even, even if Brian and I were to say disagree on a particular bird, as long as I always called those that and he always called them that, the, the measure should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you, the Sassoon Marsh has been brought up a, a number of times. Why wasn't that ever in the management area? Is it just population size down there is a little bit low? Because we're starting to see them more now. Um, when we started out at Grizzly Ranch, you know, almost 15 years ago, there was a couple banded tulies mm-hmm. shot. We didn't had no idea then what they were. Like everyone's called a speck, right? But you're starting to see a lot more of them yeah. down in Sassoon almost all year now. Where I didn't see that ten years I, ago. I talked to our caretaker yesterday. Yeah. He said he saw four different collars on our property. Yeah, cool. How many are they harvesting down there? About zero because <laughs> they yeah. don't come yeah. into our property yeah, during shoot time. So <laughs> yeah, if, if you go you go back in time to the '80s when again the tulies have been a funny thing in that there's kind of a club, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we had people that were vastly interested in them because they're cool, they're yeah. different, right? And we don't know much about them. And so Bob Smith, who retired as the manager at the Shasta Valley Wildlife Area, was uh, working at Grizzly Island in those days. And Bob was part of the Thule Club. Yeah. And, and we had more Thule sightings when Bob was there than we did for a while. And then our radio birds, what we had for a while under quote-unquote normal, is when we got fog late winter, birds from the Sac Valley would go to the Sassoon. Mm. And when it would clear, they would come back. Huh. Now, you think about last year where we had almost no rice in the west of the river. Yeah. And it's not a surprise to me that then birds would go elsewhere. Right. And what I learned from my, I followed Aleutians for three winters. That was my master's thesis. So what I learned was when roosts changed and then almost always field use would change. If we had guys sneak in and poach birds on the roost and the birds would be gone and they wouldn't come back and they'd go somewhere else to feed. And once they found a place to feed, they would keep doing that as long as it worked. 
And as soon as it stops working, they go somewhere else. So because geese have high social structures, right? Parents stay together with their young for a year at least. And um, so these traditions will change. So you may be seeing a shift down mm -hmm. to the Susun Marsh. But again, thinking about our management areas, what we're looking for, and our population estimator should be robust to that as long as those birds, because we estimate the number of markers that are out there based on how many we catch and see, how many we marked. And yeah. guys forget, you know, we know when radios go off the air. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> sometimes we find them, sometimes we don't. I, uh, sometimes. I found one in a rice field when yeah. I was working for Melanie and uh, yeah. kept going back to the spot and I knew it was close. Yeah. And she's like, just just leave it alone. Don't worry about it. I was like, no, oh, Melanie, no. I think I can find it. <laughs> yeah. And we went out there in waders in a rice field <laughs> and we had the, you know, the antenna and I got it yeah. so close. We got down on our hands and knees, and I came up with just the transmitter, just the transmitter. out of the mud. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, did. yeah it was, it was, I did an aerial telemetry one. I picked up three on Mort you know, up at the Klamath Basin, uh -huh. flew home, got in the truck, drove back up, found two of them. Yeah. One was oh, in the corner of a barley field, one was out on a dish. They'd both been scavenged. Who knows yeah. what got them? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I was working for CWA. We went up to Klamath uh, postseason. And uh, we're rocket netting, and I was still working for fishing games. So Melanie set me up with one of the um, transmitter the you know, the readers. Yeah. yeah. And so I'd go read callers and look for them. And I'm, I'm looking at this goose, and I saw a caller. I was like, oh, cool, there's some Thule geese. And I, I saw another caller, and I'm looking, and it's there's just a caller sitting on the grass. There's not touched huh? to a goose <laughs> or anything. And I Dan Lockman, I was like, Dan, look at this. There's a, there's a caller right there. And he's like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And sure enough, I walked out there, and it's just a Thule goose caller sitting right next to a Thule geese that yeah. were sitting there. Yeah, you know, I wonder, wonder where the bird that was carrying it went. Yeah, no idea. <laughs> was it still glued together? It was, yeah. yeah. It was almost yeah. like it got, my assumption was that it like got snagged on the vegetation Possible. and just pulled right over its head. Yeah, yeah, but there was no feathers, no yeah. no uh, side of a mortality or anything. Yeah, we so. tried, uh, we never put collars on immature birds, yeah. right? You know, yep. So. Yep. Anyway, I, changes in the management area, I, I would like to think, and it's a better question for the current staff yeah. than the old guy. You know, I can tell you how we got here. I can't <laughs> tell you where we're going, right? Um I would like to think, though, that as if the population is st trending stably or upwards and birds are kind of not, we're not trying to eliminate the harvest of every single Thule goose, right? Yeah. So we didn't close Klamath Basin. Lots of birds get picked off there in the fall and, and even some in these late hunts now going through. It's fine. We're not anti-hunting here, but we are pro-conservation first. Mm -hmm. And I think hunters love that. They really do. That we can't have hunting if we don't have birds. Right, and and we've got a long history of it. And I think we should be proud of it. Frankly. Absolutely. So, I think it's a good thing. Um, but yeah, on the other hand, if ninety five percent of the Thule's decide Susun Marsh is a prettier place, I know the water smells better. You know, <laughs> they're going to go down there, right? Yeah. And and if they stay, then if I was still in the game, I'd say, hey, we need to consider what's going on with harvest. If they're bulletproof. If they and sometimes they're that way, right? You know, they get in a spot, they go here, they come there, and, and seems people to be don't the get it. That's the thing is, like, they just stay in the closed zone. Yeah, and just stay yeah. there. And they yeah. don't go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So why close it? Right? right? There's no evidence that we're doing anything. Do you find it interesting that you know they had the management area for Aleutians originally, and now there's not a huge Aleutian population that stays in within? No, I don't. Right Isn't that crazy? Well, no, because it's is not it crazy the, because, because it was the goose, my work. <laughs> is it because the goose population <laughs> has expanded no, with all the other? What is no, it? No, no. It was a known border. Okay. You know, if you think about it, you don't want to move the regs around unnecessarily. So if you've got, most of you guys were probably not even born in 75, right? And so no. <laughs> you've grown up with those borders. And, and so why change them on you if no, we not, don't need to? Yeah, I'm not talking about the border, but like, why, why aren't the Aleutian geese there anymore? Well, because we, you know, when they were there, the first time we built that, that closure was designed was based on a very small bit of band recoveries. And part of my job and my predecessor, Dennis Willington, and people that came along after us, we learned that most of the time those Aleutians were spending most of their time in the Butte Sink over at Calusa Shooting, Butte Creek Farms over there at the intersection wow. of Butte Creek. And, and so... There were very few recoveries over on the west side, over the Sac, Delavan, Calusa yeah. side. But once you put a border in place like that, if we just said, you know what, we could refine this down to here and we'll move it here. And then the birds jump over there. Well, no, let's expand it and move it. No, yeah. let's just keep it as clean as we can. 
birds cross I-5 every day. Right. <laughs> yeah. We know that. Anybody that thinks we don't is just not paying attention, right? And, and so at the time, it really was, it was overkill on Aleutians, in a way, overkill. It was too big for, for protecting, but they were federally endangered. Yeah. You know, you're not going to micromanage around that. We were lucky to keep white cheek geese season open at all in California. There were probably federal endangered species biologists that will just close hunting season. Yeah. You know? So we had different different uh, approaches back then than we might have today. Um, but so no, it's got nothing to do anymore, but the borders are the same. But right? the, the yeah. shift in Aleutians, because now they're down more in the San Joaquin Valley, right? Yeah. San Joaquin Valley. Well, um, Delta. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. So yeah. that, that population that used to be in the Butte Sink is not there anymore. They've shifted their patterns. As down. far as I know. Yeah. And, and that's a good lesson. I right? heard, yeah, Butte Creek Farms doesn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the only thing to that one. The <laughs> population of spec. Like, there's a big population of specs that roost on these duck clubs. You know, that probably wasn't the case back then though, right? Well, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, we used to do, it's a great question because people ask them where the ducks are this year, right? That's a pretty, <laughs> pretty big question. And, you know, back in the day, our department did biweekly waterfowl surveys. We'd get in airplanes and two airplanes, but really all the survey was, was the closed zones on state and federal refuges. Okay. Pretty much some duck club areas and stuff like that, but you can't do that anymore which is why I kind of hesitated when you talked about midwinter indices and the abundance of pintail. It became so problematic to do a midwinter the way we used to do it with rice straw decomp. And, and we, we divide the valley in half. Mike Wolder and the crew would work north at 20 and we'd work south at 20 and into the delta. And then we'd hit fog stretches where we couldn't fly for a day. Well, we could fly the next day. So, well, we stopped at, you know, road Z. So let's now go. Well, that was pretty silly, right? Like the birds didn't move between <laughs> yesterday and today. But yep. we had to get the survey done. So our midwinter survey now in California is transect based, right? It's a different survey. So I don't want to compare its index to a previous index. And, and even that's kind of a sketchy deal. Uh, if Frank Koslick and Bob Ladon did the midwinter survey in the Sac Valley for 20 years together, and if they told me there was a 20% increase in species X or Y, I'd, I'd tend to believe them. But you throw me in the plane with Frank, and now the numbers aren't comparable anymore. Right. <clears throat> it's just a problem with winter surveys, which is why we don't generally manage off them. What you got, Brian? Oh, I was just going to say, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people in the in the closure, you know, most guys that hunt in there do complain a lot about it, but there has been quite a bit of liberalization yeah, in it, there, yeah, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, right. there used to be, it started off with one bird in the closure. Yeah, up until November 30th. And, yeah. and uh, because this is the kind of stuff I can't remember. Yeah. And, and Brian, Jeff was nice enough to let me know this one was coming. Yeah. So, um but it's yeah. important, you know, to realize that there there has been moves yeah. to, you know, liberalize that, well, that closer. I, I once had a guy when I was working that called and complained about the bag limit. He wanted to go back in time. I said, really? You want to go back to three? Right. And he went, what? I go, yeah. You don't know what the bag limits were? You know, when I was growing up, it was six geese a day, three darks and three whites. And then you could get up to six whites. And, and no, you don't want to go backwards. So, yeah. um, and it was 95 that we shrunk it back down. We uh, got rid of the stuff that was east of the river and extended the closure date to the middle of December. And so, and the bag limit went from one to two, I think somewhere in there. And then more recently, of course, you know, the bag limit's now three yeah. and the season closure has moved back to 20th or 21st, whatever it is right. of December. So there's been a half a dozen liberalizations depending on how you want to count them. And that was consistent with now we think the population is stable. We, you know, we know from the check stations that harvest is just kind of this little number, mm -hmm. you know, um, why not? And yeah. of course, Pacific's kept doing that at going up at the same time. So, I mean, it, it's a balance. It's, it's not, it's not brain surgery. Okay. <laughs> we don't have the data for that. Right. Um, I heard this from somebody else that really waterfowl hunting regulations, it, it's like driving a bus down an icy road. You're bouncing off the guardrails, and if you can stay on the road, you're doing good. And, and just <laughs> think about it that way. Go out and have fun. You know, I know some guys, I'm frustrated too, right? I hunt in the closure area, the management area. I mm -hmm. hunt there. And that's the only time white fronts come over after. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm going to, you know, I thought when they published the regs on the internet, the birds would stop reading them, but apparently <laughs> that's not working for me. So, yeah. so I know the frustration. I, 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 like I said, I've got a hunting license for 50 something years in my drawer. Yeah. I've been hunting a long time and right. I know what it's like. 
I think it goes back to like where you were talking about your surveys. If someone goes and distributes a roost or, or whatever it may be, pre- goes back to pressure. So like they know they're not getting pressured and getting shot at. Why wouldn't they stay there, right? Mm-hmm. People complain all the time like, oh, we need more hunting opportunities, which we try, try to provide. You know, why don't you open your own properties up for at the afternoons? Like, well, we try to do it to noon to limit the pressure. Yeah, we could put more people on. We would need some more staff and things like that. But then you get in this weird kind of gray area where it's like, yeah, you could put all the pressure out there and then the hunting just goes down and the birds leave to go another place where a lot of these like bigger duck clubs or some of the refuges that are bigger, it's an opportunity for the birds to rest. But like going back to the, the management area, you know, they're there if they're not getting shot at all the time and then there is a an end date, they're going to stick around. Yeah. They're, you know? Yeah. But they, yeah, yeah. But but they were, the white fronts leave. That's the other part yeah. of that end date. End, end date is that the proportion of white fronts in the harvest that are measured out to be tules starts increasing as time goes on because the Pacifics have spread out. Mm-hmm. And, and again, the last thing I think we would want is to have the similar size tule goose population within a broader Pacific and have them spread out over all hell and gone. Yeah. I mean, holy smokes. I don't know how you would constrain harvest if you needed to. I mean, mm-hmm. first off, you'd want to decide that you needed to. But if you did, I don't know what you'd do. You'd give up a ton of opportunity on Pacifics. That's what you'd have to do. Right. And so take it for what it's worth. But I think <laughs> it's it's better to have two league geese in the world and it's better to have them somewhat constrained <laughs> in a box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I know, first off, we talked about pintail stuff before we got into the two league geese. And I know, Brian, I've seen some of your stuff on the social media. So we're getting regulation news should be soon about future seasons. Well, my understanding is in February, the flyway councils are meeting, right. And, uh, kind of going over the initial structure for, um, upcoming regulations. Yeah. Well, I, I had the, 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 I had a little chat with Melanie, so that was a good thing. Uh, because, you know, I just go hunting this time of year. <laughs> and I'm getting ready to go fly fishing after that, you know, work on my golf game. But, um, yeah, so uh, the service has developed, and this there's some really, really neat stuff going on. Uh, John Eady from UC Davis here has had a couple of students that have done some fun, interesting work on integrated population models. Settinger, too, in Nevada over there. Yeah. 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 So, so that folks ought to recognize that the development of harvest regulations just doesn't come from bureaucrats and field biologists with state agencies. There's the whole academic university side out there working and feeding the system, not in necessarily a direct way, right. you know, but they're there and, and, and it's considered because at the state and federal level, the biologists or the mathematicians are professionals and they're not going to overlook peer reviewed research. They're not going to, they're trying to do better. They really are. And so They've developed a new model and they sent a request out to all four flyways. Hey, you know, you could do this or you could do that. And we'd like some input on this before we push forward. And what I saw was a commitment from the service to have their new model peer reviewed. Now, anybody that's published scientifically understands that that can be a two year process, right? You just don't submit it to Cal Waterfowl and somebody looks at it and publishes it and calls it good. No, it gets peer reviewed. And, and at this level, it's complex and, and stuff I can, can't all understand. But so while that's going on, the serve, all, my understanding is all four flyway councils have looked at that and made some comment relative to the proposals from the Pintail group. So to get it, to get it pushed through, though, all four councils have to agree that it's a priority, right? Yeah, and, and, and that's an important difference right now. So my understanding is that all four flyways had a slightly different answer. Right. <laughs> and the service has traditionally been, gee, thanks for that. We're not going to do anything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's where the SRC and the consultants play such a huge role. The flyways have a very unique thing. They have an MOU with the service in which they can, in essence, do things that the general public cannot. They meet with the service it used to be the anti-hunting folks would be in the room, and now they're not anymore, right? So what used to happen at a time like this is each of the four flyway councils said something. They each sent two consultants to the SRC meeting. They, had, they talked back and forth with the SRC, and then the evening the consultants would get together and try and hash it out among the flyways. 
And, and you just almost never knew what was going to come out of that. I was never on the, uh, as a consultant while I was on the flyway council, it rotates among the, mm-hmm. among the states. So <clears throat> that probably has to happen. And that will be, my understanding is it'll be March at the North Americas when the council will meet again. So they'll have a chance at that point for all four flyways to go, Hey, we think it's this, you think it's that. And, and if, if somebody's aggressive, they will go to all four of the flyway councils and say, what can we do to get you to come here and for you to move to there and you to move to there? Right. And that's a policy level call by people that wear suits, you know? Um, so if that goes through, my understanding is you're in the process for the 24, 25 regs. It's too late for yeah. that year, but assuming we can get concurrence across all four flyways on the parameters of a strategy, it could be adopted in 25. Yeah. yeah. And so some of the things I've heard is that the Pacific Flyway is much less concerned about the effect of a three-bird bag limit on future regulations. So one of the things that changed with AHM and strategies is predictions on frequency of packages. So how often are you going to be in a close season? How often are you going to be in a one? How often are you going to be a two or a three? And when we started with 81 strategies in 2010, Go into three, increase the probability of closed seasons. So if you're not a pintail state, you do not want to roll the dice on that one. And so even in the Pacific Flyway, we couldn't get a recommendation for a strategy that included three. And it took uh, Ron Anglin from Oregon, ran to the other three Flyway Council meetings in 2010 to make the pitch that the strategy 39 at the time was good enough for all of us for now and that we would move on. And I think if Ron hadn't done that, we'd still be living under the, the uh, prescriptive strategy that we actually developed in 96, which got us the three in 97, whichever year it was. Um, but I think it's a move forward. So from where I sit now, which is usually on my couch, um, that has to happen again in March, or we're going to be high-centered, and we won't get anything by the 25 season. Gotcha. Fingers crossed. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, because, I, I mean, we were pretty close to not getting a pintail this last year. Yeah, yeah. it was within a couple I thought, a couple thousand, right? Yeah, I don't remember the yeah, numbers. The yeah, the numbers were close. A couple yeah. thousand, yeah, yeah, from having a shut season. And you yeah, tell maybe. people that, and they're like, yeah, potentially. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, potentially. Because the, the Eastern Mallard, their strategy got them into no place they didn't want to go, and, and they all realized that, you know, these are optimal strategies to increase cumulative harvest over the long-term horizon. So if you say to yourself, okay, we're not going to close this year and it's going to cost us a bit of cumulative harvest over the long-term horizon, but we don't want closed duck seasons. No. You know, yeah. it's bad when that happens for everybody. So yeah, not, not, not a good thing. So I, I, I even though the, the prescriptive strategy or right now even says it's the optimal decision, it's not, it's not a contract, right? right. It's open to negotiation yep. if we get there. And I'd like to think cooler heads would prevail and we'd all go, Oh, that's terrible, but yeah. but you know, want a couple years to really really hit the panic button with all four feet, right? Yeah. Here's the only thing, and you and I talked about this a little bit. Yeah. You know, everything I know is old, <laughs> 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 except my grandson and my granddaughters, and and current stuff is more valuable to your listeners right now yeah. than, than what I can give. I can give you and tell you how we got here. Well, I think that's <laughs> I think that's what was important, hey, right? Knowledge is knowledge. Yeah, because I mean, I don't think a lot of people understand how we got here. Yeah, and and it, it's unfortunately complicated and bureaucratic, and can be a little bit confusing. And you know, most hunters just they want to have fun, you know, and and they want to know what the limits are. They want to go go do it. Right? Yeah, and I appreciate that, but but I can't tell you you know anything about what's going on today except what I hear secondhand, which you guys can get yourself. So I, I would encourage you to. Get some of the current managers, yeah, you know, absolutely. Make put them on the hot seat with you guys. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's so unfriendly in here, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh man. Yeah. So, awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming out and all the info that you gave us yeah, and the no, listeners. I, you know, it's it, it's like I've said. You know, it was the passion that got me into this game, and I rode a great horse for a long time, and I'm not quite ready to give it up. I don't stop caring. Right. It's just a difference of, I can't, what was that? God grant me that to know the difference between things I can change and things I can't change. <laughs> you know, you sleep a lot better at night when you go, you know what? 
not my job, man. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Leave it to you young people to fix. Thanks for having me, though. <laughs> thank you for awesome. coming on. Yeah, thank we, you for coming on. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Save It for the Blind podcast. You can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.